is a registered midwife and holds a master's degree in public health from Otago University. She has broad midwifery practice experience from community based. Um, yeah. hmm? Okay. Case loading, midwife led continuity of care settings to tertiary hospital care. And she is currently the chief executive of the New, New Zealand College of Midwives. Um, and in the interest of time, if you don't mind, I'm going to shorten your extensive experience, um, <laughs> Allison and go on to Carol, um, who is, um, has a background in nursing, midwifery, and lactation consulting, and a postgraduate diploma in child adv advocacy, sorry, and a Master of Health Sciences from the University of Otago. Um, her thesis explored mother's experiences initiating lactation and establishing breastfeeding in a neonatal intensive care environment. Um, she's been actively involved in, uh, in New Zealand um, milk banking and lactation support and has um, lots of other credentials in her field. And um, we are looking forward to hearing your talk and take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, could you go to the back to the previous slide, please, please, Catherine? Sure. Um, previous slide, sorry, backwards, oh, not previous. forwards. Wait. Yeah. Um, just a, you're going the wrong way, sorry. I know. That's weird. <laughs> if you right click, you should be able to go previous. Well, but okay, here we go. Right. Yeah. If I use the arrows, thank you. That thank works you. Better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to just to frame the presentation, Carol and I put in two separate abstracts: one around the role of the college and the work we've done to support um, midwifery response to climate change. And Carol's pre Carol's abstract was on um, the role of midwifery and you know breastfeeding support around humanitarian disasters. So we've um, at the request of the conference organisers, we've combined these into one presentation. So I'll start and then I'll hand over to Carol and then a short wrap up at the end, just so you understand the flow and why the two topics are together in the same presentation. So just a, by way of framing um, and context, um, we are from New Zealand. This is a small country in the South Pacific, approximately five, five million people. We have um, more than 200 different ethnic groups with 160 languages. We're considered a super diverse country in terms of our population makeup. Um, we're located on what is known as the Pacific Rim of Fire, where the tectonic plates meet around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. So we're no strangers to earthquakes um, and other natural disasters. However, climate change has increased the frequency of these events. We're seeing more flooding, storms, widespread damage to infrastructure and housing, you know, and also experiencing bushfires now too. Um, we have a very varied geography with um, forests, lakes, rivers, mountains, a relatively sparsely populated country. So even though we are a high income and high resource country, it's very complex and expensive for us to maintain our infrastructure um, because of the, our small population and, and diverse geography. Our close proximity to the Pacific um, and the migration patterns mean that we have a significant and growing population of immigrants or New Zealand born Pacific uh, people. Um, and we know the effects of climate change are disproportionately experienced by the small low lying island nations across the Pacific. And this, these are very real and present issues for New Zealand because of our demography and our close foreign policy um, setting, which is orientated towards the Pacific. Um, so that, that's the, the context and background for us. Next slide. Thank you, Catherine. Um, New Zealand has a colonial history with our indigenous population who migrated from the Pacific centuries ago, experiencing the detrimental and devastating effects of colonisation by the British and European settlers and immigrants from the early 1800s and onwards. In 1840, representatives from the British Crown um, established a treaty with the indigenous Māori population who were represented by their, their tribal or iwi chiefs. This document, the Treaty of Waitangi, or Te Treaty or Waitangi, is a foundational document for our nation, which in theory protects the rights of Māori to govern their affairs and resources and to, to have health equity. And of course, as you can imagine, as is the case in pretty much every setting where colonisation has occurred, 
these obligations have not been met and the rights of the Indi New Zealand's indigenous population have not been respected or protected. And for many Māori, climate change is not an isolated risk. It impacts can be felt on a spiritual level and its effects are intrinsically linked to the complex le legacy of colonisation. Next slide, thanks, Catherine. Uh, so just a bit about the New Zealand College of Midwives. We were established um, 33 years ago. Um, we uh, were established at a critical point in New Zealand's um, professional development, midwifery's professional development, uh, at a time when midwifery had been sort of subsumed by nursing. Um, so the, the, the establishment of the college gave an opportunity for um, midwifery to, to step forward again, to regain autonomy and to have that distinct recognition as a profession in its own right. Um, over those years, we've been very successful in growing our membership. We now represent over 95% of practicing midwives in New Zealand. We also welcome student members and consumers or women who are um, consumers of maternity care. And that's been a significant um, historical fact of the college to have that, that membership as part of our organization. Um, we work on behalf of individual midwives, of course, but we also um, represent the collective. And with that collective representation comes responsibilities to raise issues that are of concern to the profession um, or issues which are impacting on birthing women and their babies or their families. Next slide, thank you. So with this in mind, um, this was this, this collective um, responsibility that was in, in our minds when we decided as an organisation to take an interest in climate change. And there were two main driving, um, driving reasons for that. Firstly, the documented adverse effects on pregnant women as a result of climate change. The effects were morally compelling for us. We've, we've seen from um, meta-analysis that rising temperatures increase the risk for preterm birth. During heat waves, the odds of preterm birth go up significantly. Um, and higher temperatures are also linked to lower birth weights um, in many studies as well. And the risks are disproportionately affected by women in lower socioeconomic groups in countries with poor infrastructure or low resource settings or at age extremes. Wildfire and exposure to air pollution have also been linked in um, large population studies to the risks of fetal anomalies, in particular gastrochesis. Um, and we also know that pregnant women, infants, young children are amongst the most vulnerable populations in response to the climate change effects. And these are populations that already suffer from inequity, poverty and marginalisation in many environments. The second reason was actually, as a profession, we believe we could make a difference. Um, we work in a model where we uh, value low technology and sustainability. We also work with women and their families at a really critical point in their lives when often they're looking and making decisions about how they want to bring their children up. They're often thinking to the future and the sort of world they want to leave for their children that they're, they're, they're having. Um, so we think that as a profession, we can also have influence and impact in the work that we do individually with women and their families and in the practices that we undertake. But also as a collective, we can raise our voices and advocate for change. Next slide, thank you. Um, next slide, thank you. So the first action, and at this point I want to acknowledge um, Dr Lorna Davies, um, a mid New Zealand-based midwife, who um, put forward a statement for our college to take to the ICM council meeting in Prague in 2014 on climate change. Um, that um, statement was ratified and accepted at the time. And since then, um, we have um, ratified our own statement, our own New Zealand College of Midwives statement, position statement or consensus statement on climate change. So um, Lorna's work has had a significant impact and left a significant legacy for us. Her PhD thesis was on midwifery and sustainability, and she's published widely on this topic. So um, there's some words on the slide from a blog that she's written. Um, but I think it's actually gave us a, she 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 gave us some leadership that we took the challenge up on behalf of the profession through Lorna's work and advocacy. Um, next slide, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Next slide, thanks. Um, so we also recognise that um, climate change, individual action alone, 
won't save us. So <laughs> we all need to take action, but we also need to elevate the actions to the level of government. And particularly when we consider the practices of corporates and capitalism, um, for me, a significant um, light bulb and turning point was reading Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, where she critiqued uh, our economic infrastructure, our economic system. So uh, the point of this slide really is to recognise that as a college, um, we have a responsibility on behalf of the McGriffey Collective, but actually we can we could join our voices with even more um, entities to make a stronger statement. So next slide, please. Um, so in New Zealand, um, next slide, yeah, in, in New Zealand we have a health and climate change council called Order Tayo. Um, and New Zealand College of Midwives joined Order Tayo in 2019. This is a dedicated um, entity which represents health professionals who are concerned about climate change and the urgent threat that it is posing to, to health and also to health equity. Uh, the college, we're a member, it's multidisciplinary, and we've ratified the joint call to action, which Auditio had published. So they have a two-pronged approach. They want to reduce, they, they want advocacy to reduce the health sector's contribution to climate change. Globally, it's estimated that 5% of all climate um, climate gases or greenhouse gases are produced by the health sector. Um, so that's, and the footprint would be bigger uh, in countries like ours that are well resourced, that have more resources and use more resources in their health system. Um, so that's one of their, um, one of their um, approaches, but they're also looking to, um, to create advocacy, to create change at the same time. Next slide, please. Uh, so as a college, um, we have also recognised that just publishing a statement in and of itself, although um, putting our position forward and creating a platform for us to move forward from, we needed to do far more in terms of what we documented, the information we provided and the advocacy we took. So I'd really like to acknowledge Carol's work in establishing this page on our website um, where you can see we have information about climate change, specific um, page around things that midwives do can take action, information and education and news updates. This is a really dynamic and um, frequently updated page because I know Carol dedicates a lot of time to this. So we felt that the statement itself needed more. We needed to have more opportunities for midwives to engage with this information and for it to be really relevant and tailored to them. So this has been a key communication strategy for us with our members and the public. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, just a, a slide again for Oratayo, and our next slide again. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so Oratayo, um, as you can see, uh, have got quite a lot of information on their website as well, and they have been um, leading policy, leading advocacy for policy changes to actually improve the health of the environment at a broad level. So they're looking at um, promoting strategies that reduce greenhouse gas through transportation, um, increasing physical activity in transportation, healthy food production, things like housing, and recognising that there's a disproportionate effect, so policies that mitigate that for particular communities. Um, they also recognise that um, uh, it, you know, the wide-ranging effects of climate change are, um, are really significant and that we have taken quite a strong advocacy around um, policy and, and changes that the, the system needs to make across not just health, but across all sectors. Next slide, thank you. And next one again, thank you. Yep. So as you can see, uh, this is Ken from Auditio, the, um, the disproportionate effects on health uh, are, are relate to many, many different areas, um, not just for our area about maternity, but you can see the health-related effects for cardiovascular, um, you know, all sorts of disease diseases and things, but also things to do with um, environmental disasters and the impacts that they have on displacement of people, uh, access to food and water sanitation, things like that, are all health impacts that are directly climate change related. Next slide, please. Uh, we also take the opportunity to link with the International Confederation of Midwives and using their communications methods and means to promulgate the messages and the concern and the advocacy. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and another key strategy for us in communicating with our members has been to use our regular quarterly magazine uh, to publish a series of articles giving really specific um, uh, information and advocacy, all sorts of things. And this particular article we wrote with, um, or we co-wrote with the anaesthetist, who's actually a member of the Oratio, so again, our multidisciplinary connections through that forum. Um, this was around the impact of nitrous oxide, which is a, has a significant impact as a greenhouse gas. We are not advocating that women shouldn't have access to nitrous oxide. It's important that they do. But what this article talked about was how we can remove it from the environment through scavenger units and the methods that can be used to do that. Uh, so that, that was the point of this article. Next, next page, please. Next slide. This was uh, an advocacy piece that was in our magazine looking up uh, how we could make a difference in the things that we can do through advocacy to address climate change. Uh, next next page, please. Uh, this was the this was the article which I highlighted earlier around the actual impacts on pregnant women and babies because of climate change, summarising the evidence and effects. Um, we've also published articles around um, consumerism, um, how to measure your carbon footprint, and how to reduce individual impact through practice. And there's more information about that on our website. Um, food systems and food production to reduce waste and green feeding. Uh, preparation for disaster and emergency and Indigenous perspectives of climate change. So these have been a really key way and means for us to connect with our members and to, um, to raise awareness and to provide some practical and useful information at the same time. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another action that we've taken uh, is to make sure we, we submit on legislative change as it is being put forward in New Zealand to highlight the health impacts of climate change, the impact particularly for us on pregnant women and babies, uh, and also the wider public health effects around climate change too. So again, I want to acknowledge Carol's work because she does write a lot of our submissions. Um, sustainable health equity should be a goal of all aspects of climate action. And I think that's, that's the approach that we've taken in the response to the submissions that we've been invited to put forward. Uh, these are also on our website, and I'll put our website address in the chat for anyone who's interested to look at our web pages, to look at our submissions, um, and encourage anyone to get in touch if they wanted to pursue and take forward any of the um, any of the further information or seek, seek further information about any of the things that we've been discussing. Um, yeah, I think you might need to slip through the next two slides, Catherine, and I'll now hand to Carol. Thanks, Alison. <clears throat> Thank you. So, my, excuse me, my voice is just going. Um, my session really is looking at infant feeding, which is linked to pretty well everything that Alison's just been talking about as well, of course. And so my interest started in 2009 when the World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action, WABA, their um, World Breastfeeding Week theme was infant feeding, um, infant and young child feeding in emergencies. And at that point, I had no idea about anything to do with this, so I started looking into it and started to try and get the um, civil defence on, on board with it. Anyway, of course, then um, we had the earthquakes the next couple of years, so um, we really needed to start looking at what action we could take. Midwives, of course, are key people, and we developed this another statement, a consensus statement, about infant feeding natural disasters in 2012. So um, it's just a commitment to how midwives can support breastfeeding and infant feeding. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see there, we had quite a lot of earthquakes um, in New Zealand and all these things caused um, some serious issues for feeding. Um, loss of clean water, electricity and gas disruption, housing damage, damage to roads, um, services reduced, um, issues with food safety, and of course the continuing um, threat of earthquakes and aftershocks. And most if not all of the community services did close down. Um, midwives kept going. So midwives were still doing home visits and continuing the care of pregnant women and birthing women and postnatal women and babies throughout the whole of this time. Um, it's interesting, there was a report from the um, bushfires in Australia um, by Carleen Gribble and others, um, which was in 2019 and 20, and they found that caring for an, an infant profoundly affected the caregiver's uh, response to an, to an emergency. Everything was much slower, it was more, um, there was more care had to be taken to get these babies and mothers and families out. And I think that 
Midwives have historically sort of been overlooked a little bit when it comes to planning um, for any disaster or earthquake. And so midwives need to get onto the table, get onto the committees, I think, and because they play a really key role. The Emergency Nutrition Network, um, they have an infant feeding and emergencies core group and they develop guidance and resources um, about all aspects of infant feeding and emergencies. And they have a really good website, which is worth having a look at in terms of operational guidance. And midwives do play a role in operational guidance. Um, and I think it's really worth having a look at that, actually. Um, next slide, I think. Thank you. So what is what are we talking about? Well, an emergency, as we know, is an extraordinary extreme situation that puts the health and survival of populations at risk. Um, infants are particularly vulnerable. And as Alison said previously, pregnant women and mothers are particularly vulnerable also. So these plans that we're talking about are designed to safeguard survival and safeguard health, growth and development. One of the key issues in emergencies related to breastfeeding and infant feeding is that there's a lot of mythology um, and the people generally running areas where mothers and babies go to don't necessarily know a lot about the issues. So the knowledge about the lack of knowledge about physiology and how emergencies affect lactation can be quite damaging. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, Carleen Gribble um, looked at whether the emergency preparedness plans in Australia um, were going very well. So she did an audit. So what she found was that um, there was a lack of planning still um, in terms of infant feeding emergencies. I did a little snapshot to look and see what the preparedness was in New Zealand for infant and young child feeding. And our Ministry of Health have developed guidelines for um, babies up to one year. Um, it's just not very easy to find. So when you go onto the different, um, what used to be the DHBs, district health boards, which are now Te Fata Ora, um, not the, the sites are not really, it's not intuitive. You can't find your way to the guidance very easily. It also still only goes up to one year. It doesn't look at babies, uh, infants past one year, children, and it continues to advise um, that you use cool boiled water for reconstituting powdered infant formula. And one of the issues in emergencies is that you don't have access to clean water and you often don't have access to um, any way of actually boiling that water to make it safe. So it's really one of the key issues with infant feeding is not just about supporting breastfeeding women, it's also about supporting women and families who are using formula and how to keep them as safe as possible. And I think during the earthquake with midwives visiting homes, that is the only way that you can actually make sure that the information gets through on a regular basis. Um, next slide, please. So simple fact sheets can be useful. Um, I developed some during the emergency here, um, which had been, but they've been around a little bit. They've actually been um, translated into um, in other countries and they've been used. So it's just very simple things. And I designed them with the idea of the people in the tents or the refuge centers would not have a lot of knowledge about breastfeeding. Certainly if there are midwives around in those tents and those emergency centers, it makes an awful lot of difference. But just basic things like how you support oxytocin response, how you overcome come simple breastfeeding challenges, how to end express breast milk, because actually cleaning a breast pump if you're needing to use one is quite difficult. Um, and also the logistics of um, if you are using donor milk, sometimes it's suggested that donor milk is the answer, but it sort of isn't because unless you're directly feeding a baby, um, wet nursing, because the logistics of keeping donor milk safe are just as problematic as the logistics of keeping formula safe for babies. So these are all just very simple um, fact sheets, which I'm very happy to share with anybody who's interested. You'll have my contact details um, somewhere, I'm guessing. Um, but I think one of the main issues is countering mythology, like what people think about breastfeeding, what's real for breastfeeding is sometimes completely different things. Next slide, please. So midwives support women, and we know how important mothers are. So mothers provide warmth, they provide protection for the babies, security, there's reduction of stress, um, optimal nutrition, and protection from illness and death. But the women need support as well to actually achieve this. So that's why midwives are very important, because midwives support women. And all these issues here are related to mothers and babies and related to what midwives protect from mothers and babies from. Um, Carleen Gribble talked about um, issues to do with um, infant formula distribution, which I think is a key issue. In New Zealand, we have um, the Ministry of Health providing guidance 
on how we deal with um, what's often, what are often unwanted donations of infant formula. And I think midwives, again, play a key role in this. Um, the appropriate support for breastfeeding and the appropriate support for non-breastfeeding mothers mm -hmm. and families um, is a key issue that needs to be addressed. Um, this slide that you're looking at now is actually was developed by Magdalena Woolery, who works with the International Baby Food Action Network, who I also do some work with. And this is just to say that, in fact, breastfeeding is emergency preparedness. The mothers who are breastfeeding manage much better in emergencies than other mothers. So the key issue here, again, is supporting mothers to breastfeed and to continue breastfeeding and support them through breastfeeding um, when things are going really all pear-shaped in a disaster. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, so now we're just on our, our wrap up, really, yeah. our next few slides. And um, this is really the summary messages from our presentation. Um, so we can lead the way um, with, with action and to support the response to climate change and to reduce the carbon footprint. I like that term, carbon handprint. Yes. Uh, we can also support our capacity building through education. And I think um, Carol's points around emergency preparedness are really um, critical as well and certainly our experience in New Zealand is that midwives have not been invited to the table at, at strategic level to prepare for climate emergencies yet we know midwives are on the ground in communities they know where the pregnant women are they know where the vulnerable families are and we need to absolutely be um, in, invited to be part of that discussion I know that's one of the key planks of ICM's new strategic plan um, we also can pro provide the operational guidance as, as um, Carol's highlighted around the infant feeding issues. Um, we can provide education, we can support um, information to be part of undergraduate programs, uh, and then I know that's being actively considered and included now in the undergraduate programs in New Zealand, and also the, the networks that we can establish um, on the ground to support the response to climate change, but also in relation to in infant feeding. And of course, we can actively advocate for change, and we've done that in New Zealand through our own work and through our work with Oratayo. Um, last slide, thank you. And this is just uh, finishing up with a quote um, from Lorna Davies, whom uh, we acknowledged earlier in the presentation, who was really the catalyst for us as an organisation to take up this challenge and to plant the seed so that we could grow the movement. And I, I won't read that out, but I might perhaps if we just leave the slide up for a, for a, for a few moments, Catherine, so that um, the participants can read it and then um, we'll take any questions or open the floor for discussion. Thank you. Mm. All right, I have opened the chat, so please put, um, please put your questions in. So far I just see our countries. Um, one new message. All right, so Chelsea, a student midwife from New Zealand, has also studied or previously studied environmental science, and she is stoked to be hearing your talk. Um, Single-use plastics, where do we even start reducing our footprint within the hospital se setting where... Um, so much plastic is used and thrown out, I guess. That's a really great point. Thank you, Chelsea. And um, one of the articles that we did in the series in our magazines was looking at, um, it must have been last year or the year before, the DHBs, now Te Whatawara districts, have got sustainability targets and were actually required to publish on things like this, reduction of waste, um, carbon emissions, a whole range of things, and we're actually in, in league tables <laughs> uh, to really start um, trying to bring about, create pressure and to create sort of measurement to create change. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There's so much single use plastic in healthcare. Uh, I think what we, you know, what the things that we've been encouraging midwives to think about in their own practice in the sphere they have control over is to reduce that, to, to think about the equipment they use, to think about the um, the way that they, they go about their day-to-day -day work so they reduce or minimise that. But it is a big beast to tackle given how um, how equipment is 
developed and packaged and everything is now disposable. I mean, thinking my going back to my practice over many years, um, metal speculums were standard and now they're plastic and disposable. So there's been one of many examples where we've moved from stainless steel or, or recleanable re equipment to um, disposable equipment because it seems to be the, the sort of um, cultural change that we've seen in health where we think things like that are better when in fact they're not. So, yes, I think I really um, encourage you to go back and look at that article. If you wanted to get in touch, I can send you um, the link to that so you can have a look because that was certainly um, one of, certainly under the last government was one of their drivers and, and one of the reasons um, that they, you know, one the, the activities they used to try and hold the hospitals to account. Mm -hmm. And again, Oratayo was, um, um, you know, also part of that discussion as well. Mm. There are quite a few different groups, um, Midwifian nursing yeah. groups um, on Facebook and various places where yeah. they look at recycling as well. So there's some really active, really good ideas come through on those pages too. Yeah. All right. So um, here's a question. Oh, J Jane is asking about your success in recruiting midwives to join your professional association. I mean, 95% participation from the professionals in your country, that's just amazing. Um, but yeah. she said she had the honor of working in Wellington from 93 to 96, and it was so exciting to see midwifery being reclaimed. Um, here in the US, many fewer than half of all US midwives belong to our national association. Um, and she thanks you for a great talk. And guess what? Still uses metal speculums. But anyway, I agree. How do you get people invested in their professional association? It's um, like, you know. <sighs> yeah. Well, I think um, we certainly didn't start out um, as such. We, you know, it started with a small number and the, the membership has grown and grown and grown and grown. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few key strategic decisions along the way that have led to the success we've got. But I suppose the, two, um, the one point I would make is, because um, I recently gave a talk in, on my ICM, I'm a member of the ICM um, board for the Western Pacific region, I gave a talk at our regional meeting just about member associations and how to grow membership. And the, the approach that I learned from my predecessors um, is actually act like you've got a cast of thousands and people will, fo will follow and actually claim the moral authority to speak on behalf of the profession, say the things that you know they believe in and the values that they have, express mm -hmm. those and show leadership and people want to become part of a movement. Um, that's the idealistic Pollyanna view. <laughs> uh, but the critical, um, the critical dis uh, sort of strategic decisions that the college has made along the way that have helped grow our membership is that we provide indemnity insurance for practice issues, disciplinary and practice issues. So that's a big, um, a big driver for many midwives. And secondly, we have got a midwives union here for our, oh. our members who are employed, but they are the college. We establish that as a separate entity. Uh, and in order, and in order to belong to the union, you also have to belong to the college because mm -hmm. we provide the indemnity and the union literally just does the um, the um, negotiation around paying conditions for the employed midwives. So we, the way we've organised our structure has, has supported us to grow our membership to be so complete. We're really fortunate. Right. Yeah. Well, we're, we're still, um, US nurses are still grappling with um, whether they should unionise or not. That's a whole other question, but um, but definitely it seems to have benefits over there. Yeah. Is uh, I I didn't introduce you. Is as our facilitator in training, and do you have any questions for Carol or Ellison? Issa? anything you'd like to um, share from your experience in Indonesia? Um, specifically, I'm really excited to read a one by one for your slide because it's really interesting. And also, yep, again, about um, climate change is really uh, having big impact, in, especially in Indonesia, because we have a densely population. And I think I have the same question with Jane, but you already uh, answered it. But um, could you share more about um, how you uh, take initiative, really, 
I think in Indonesia, I don't uh, met any midwife focusing in here. But again, we know that the impact of climate change is really big. Yeah, uh, for us, we've utilized opportunities where we've had, um, uh, we had a big weather event last year in January. We had two very close together mm -hmm. um, within sort of almost a week of each other that had significant devastating impacts um, in Auckland particularly and on our um, eastern North Island coast. And so we use those opportunities to really highlight and take um Take, take you know take that as an opportunity to um, raise awareness and to raise awareness of the role of midwives but also to raise awareness um, amongst the profession of the need for advocacy mm -hmm. so we would um, use the media if people contact us we you know use um, media statements to invite media interest to really bring it to the public attention and make sure that we communicate those through our membership through social media as well as our website in our membership magazine, we also did an article, I didn't highlight it, but we did an article um, about midwives working through that period of time. Um, and if we have any opportunities where we've got, you know, media, we, we absolutely use those and promote those opportunities as well. So that's just another way of bringing attention to the issue and making it very um, uh, tangible because the weather events are very significant and they really impact people. When you think about climate change, as a concept, it's very big and it's very hard to know how to how to proceed. But when you can bring it down to something very tangible like that, it does help motivate people to take action. Right. So Chelsea yeah. has also has one more very pertinent question, oh. although she says it's specifically to um, New Zealand, but I think it applies um, around the world, is when will climate change and... Uh, sustainability be incorporated in nurse, nurse midwifery programs or midwifery degrees um, that it will be the only time that some midwives are confronted with facts around our carbon footprints as midwives. Mm -hmm. to, so do you foresee it being a requirement for midwifery education? I don't. The, our midwifery council sets the pre-registration standards, so it set, dictates what needs to be in the programs. Um, they will be reviewed shortly because the scope of practice is changing here. So that, that's an opportunity for us to advocate that to be a requirement. I do know that because Lorna Davies was teaching in the undergraduate program here at ARA, and I know that that was definitely part of the curriculum. And it is also for the, the new, um, we've, we're having a um, sort of merger with Polity, well, we were under our old government, because <laughs> they're going to be a single national curriculum for all of them. So it is already part of, uh, I know it's part of the new curriculum for that for those institutes. So I think it's probably institute by institute specific at this point, but there definitely are some that are that are taking it up. And it's a point of advocacy for us to to really ask for the new standards when they're produced, possibly later this year or next year, for this to be a, a requirement rather than a nice to have. So good point. Thank you, Chelsea. Absolutely. Okay, and if and if um, Carol, you mentioned contact information. If you if you both could put your contact information in the chat, so people can get in touch with you, and then I will go on and do our closing slides, so we can wrap up this um, excellent session.